Peace is one of those very fragile asset. It doesn't take much to lose peace. Peace be between nations, it just takes just an, a mistake from a, a leader and we lose peace. It, it doesn't take much to lose peace in a family. If you are married, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't take much to lose peace in a house. If you have a brother or a sister, you know what I'm talking about. Mm. Peace, is <laughs> peace is very fragile. Yeah, it just takes something, just, just a small thing for peace to disappear in a relationship. It doesn't matter how much you love each other. Peace is very fragile, very fragile. So, but, but where does it go? Where does it go? I've realized that there are three things that affect or that steal our peace. There are three things. Where they, oh, there are three places that our peace goes when we lose it. There are three things, three issues, three main issues that steal, that take our, our, our peace away. The first one is what happened to you. The second one is what is happening to you. And the third one, you can guess, what might happen to you. It's all in time. What happened to you, what is happening, and what might happen, steal your peace. So our perspective on our past, our perspective on the present, and our perspective on the future are the main factor that determine whether you have peace or not. Your view on your past, present, and future affect your peace. So how you handle your past, how you manage your present, and how you think about your future determine if you're at peace now or not. If you're at peace with in your relationships, or if you're at peace at work, or if you're at peace now within yourself, is because of those three things and how you handle them or what you think about them. So if you want a peaceful life, you need to make peace with your past, make peace with your present, and make peace with your future. Sounds like time. Yes, make peace with time. Past, present, and future. I believe Jesus came to make peace with time. He came to make peace with the past, the present, and the future. That's what I believe. So stay with me. Stay with me as uh, we unpack this. How do we make peace? And why is it necessary to make peace with our past, present, and future? Let's go through history. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says... For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. That was 700 years before Jesus, 700 BC. The prophet Isaiah predicted that one day in the future, the Prince of Peace will be born. They lacked peace back then, and he predicted that. The prince of peace can also be translated as the ruler of peace. The ruler of peace will be born. It's the word Sashalom in Hebrew. They translate as prince of peace because it rhymes. P, P, prince of peace. But we can say ruler of peace. He rules in peace, Jesus. So, you can be in a land ruled by a ruler of peace and not experience peace. You can be in a land, in a peaceful land, and not experience peace. Why? Because you have to abide by the rules of the peaceful land to experience peace. Australia is at peace. 
but not everybody is at peace in Australia. Why? Because some people are in jail for not abiding by the rules of the peaceful land, you get to be taken away because you are interfering with other people's peace. So if you interfere with other people's peace, we kick you out. You lose your peace. So when Jesus came to reign as the prince of peace, it's not everybody who accepted him. Luke chapter 2, 13 to 14. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the prophecy was fulfilled, that is now the year Jesus was born, 700 years after the prophecy, God sent angels to announce that that prophecy is being fulfilled. And in their words, they said, peace on earth, because the ruler of peace has been born. Now you can celebrate because the ruler of peace is here. It was announced. And then Jesus started to, to do his stuff. He started to heal people. He started to, 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 to preach. He started to teach people. He started to do things. And here is Jesus himself in John chapter 14, verse 24. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Jesus affirms now, I came to establish peace, and I'm giving it to you. He gave it to his disciples and anyone, to anyone who will accept it. He gave the peace that was prophesied 700, 700 years before him, the peace that the angels declared, announced that it has been delivered, and himself, he affirmed it. He said, my peace I give to you. So if prophet Isaiah promised peace, if the angels announced peace, and if Jesus himself gave us peace, why do we still struggle with worry? Why do we still struggle with fear and hatred? Why do we still lack peace? While we can see in history Peace was promised, peace was announced, peace was given, but still we are struggling with fear. We are still struggling with worry. It's because most people have let their heart be troubled. troubled. Let's go back to what Jesus said. Don't let your heart be troubled. He knew even though I give you peace, but you let you had to be troubled, you lose it. It's one thing to be given peace. It's another thing to maintain peace. So what Jesus was saying is, I'm giving you my peace. Do not let the peace go away. So the let is your responsibility. The gift is given. Let, let, do not let. The peace being taken from you was what Jesus was saying. When Jesus said, Peace I give to you. It's your responsibility to take the package, to open it, to see what is inside. Ah, is this what you gave to me? And enjoy it. It is our responsibility to receive gift, the peace of God, and activate it and start enjoying it. So this is what we do. There are three things you need to do to enjoy the peace that God has given to you. Three things. The first one is simple. Make peace with your past. Make peace with your past. That's where you need to start. Two um, of the most dangerous, the most dangerous peace killers are offense and guilt. Offense is for what has happened to you. And guilt is for what you have done to others. 
Offense is about what has happened to you. Guilt is what you've done. We've all made mistakes in life. We've all made mistakes. And we've all been offended somehow. If you are here today and nobody has offended you, please just put your hand up. We will all come to you for advice. How did you escape offenders? You are so skilled if you are here and nobody has offended you. Oh, uh, no one. Sorry. Ah, oh, I see a small hand like this. That is very good. That is very good, NG. Eh? That's good. <laughs> I mentioned your name because people need to come to you and ask, what did you do? Oh, if you are here and you've never offended anyone, please let us know. We are willing to learn from you. You have no reg regrets. You have no guilt in you. You've never, never offended anyone. <laughs> if you've been around for some time, you have offended people. Even a baby offends people. Yeah. When they cry without stopping. <laughs> they don't know they're offending us, but they do. We just tolerate them because we know one day they will stop. Of <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, 32. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Offense means you are following your past. Your past has stayed there, but you go back to find it. You are following it. Wherever it goes, you go back there. This is what happens. The future is moving forward. The past is going back. And you are following the past. That means you are not living in the present. Because you are, the more future, the more the future goes forward and the present keeps moving forward. And you are following the past, you are staying behind, isn't it? You keep going back. Years and years and years. If we are in 2022 and you were offended in 2010, you have gone 10 years back from where you were supposed to be. You're supposed to be in 2022. You are following your past. That's offense. Guilt is another story. Guilt is your past is following you. Hmm. <laughs> Your past is following you. It's attached to you. You go left, your, your past is with you. You go right, your past is with you. Everywhere you go, you, your, your, your past is with you. Your past is with you. And most people are seated here, your past is attached to you. Wherever you go, you can see your past. You can see your past. Your past is following you. Most people are still attached to the past. Either by gift, by, by guilt, sorry, by guilt, it's attached to you, or by offense, you are following it. You are following it. Peace comes when you break the offense guilt tie with your past. When you break it, you stop following it, and you break it, stop it from following you. Then you find peace. It sounds funny. It's hard. It's hard to break the tie with your past. To tell your guilt, stop following me. And to tell your offense, I'm stopping to follow you. It's hard. It's hard. That's why the Bible says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive one another just as God has forgiven you. Look, this is the remedy of both offense and guilt, this passage. Forgiving one another is a command. It's a command to deal with offense. That's how we make peace with your past. You forgive the past. You forgive. forgive forgiving someone is not justifying what they've done to you. You don't need to justify or to explain this is why they did it. That's the, the issue. Sometimes when we struggle to justify or to understand why they did it, we struggle to forgive. Because we want to understand why they did it. And when you, sh you, you, you struggle to justify why they did it, you struggle to forgive. Forgiveness is not about understanding the why. You don't have to explain the why. It's just simply to give up your right to be right. You give it up. 
That is forgiveness. Remember, you are your own judge in your own heart. And you are the own, your, your complainant in your own heart. You come with a case before the judge and you tell the judge, this person has done this to me. Who is the judge? Yourself. You are yourself the judge complaining against someone else in your own heart. And then you as a judge in your heart, you decide to punish the person. So your heart determines what you're going to do to the person because you are the judge and you are the complainant. How, 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 dumb, how unfair that is. It's so unfair. You are yourself the judge, yourself the complainant. So you come to your heart and you say, because of what they've done, the punishment, I will never talk to you again. Oh, you feel good. You feel relieved about it. Of course, the, the, the judge is in your favor because it's you. Or you say, no, because of this, I will never give you money anymore. I will not come to your place anymore. I will not ever text you anymore. I will never, never, never. You establish your punishment. The things that you feel, they are fair to the punishment. And then God says, forgive. Oh, forgiveness is not about going back. No, forgiveness is about withdrawing the punishment. Simple. The judge just says, I understand what they've done is wrong, but I withdraw the punishment. Every punishment I've established, I withdraw it because I'm my own judge. And that's forgiveness. You can still feel bad. You can still hurt. You can still feel in your heart it's painful. But that decision is forgiveness. The emotions will follow. That's how we, dis we, 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 we break the tie with the past. When we make that decision to forgive, we break the tie with the past. That's the law of the kingdom. That's what Jesus came to preach. But also the command says, you must forgive as God forgave you in Christ. I, I love that this, this passage covers everything. Through Jesus, your guilt has been taken away. God in heaven has decided to forgive your sin, your mistakes. Whatever you said back then, whatever you did back then, it doesn't matter how tough or how bad, how hurtful, how painful it was, God has decided to forgive you. Who are you to keep yourself accountable for what God has forgiven? You see the mistakes we make? God has decided to forgive us, but we keep ourselves in chains. I can't believe I did it. I can't believe. So what? We can't also believe you did it. <laughs> so what after that? After we all don't believe you did it. Okay, we can't all believe you did it. So what after that? So we, the conclusion is what? How long are we going to ask themselves, ourselves that question? We can't believe you did it. We can't believe you did it. We can't believe you did it. So Jesus says, I have forgiven you. As my father has forgiven you, take that forgiveness. Accept it. Your mistake has been forgiven. Who are you to keep judging you? That's why we need to make peace with the past. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. It's not just about forgiving others. Forgive the guilt. Like you, you've done it. It's fine. It, you, they, they, the hardest person to forgive is you, yourself. You know that. For the mistakes you've made. The hardest person to forgive is yourself. To release yourself from the guilt is to understand that God, the judge of the universe, has forgiven you. It is your own, it's for your own interest to forgive yourself. To step into God's forgiveness. God, you have forgiven me. I'm not mo more righteous than you. To keep myself in chains, I forgive myself too. And receive God's forgiveness. That's how we make peace with the past. You forgive others because you have been forgiven. And Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Let's now look, let's look at the present. The most dangerous killer, peace killer in the present is ingratitude in the present. We lose peace when we lose sight of the big or small things God has done for us. We lose our peace. 
Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. There is a promise of peace in this passage. God has promised us peace. This is one of the most challenging verses in the Bible. This one. I wonder if the writer of this book understood the meaning of the word anything. Oh, I don't know if we understand what anything means. Because anything means anything. I only trust the Holy Spirit because he's the author. Not the writer. The author of the Bible. And that's why I trust the word anything means anything. Otherwise, it's almost impossible not to worry about anything. If I'm walking in the garden and I see a snake, the Bible says do not worry about it. (laughs) Anything? No, I should worry about it. At least, yeah, okay. No, I shouldn't. We shouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) it says we should take all our issues to God with thanksgiving this is what we normally do if you are a good Christian you take your issues to God then you dump them on Jesus feet take it, take it and take that one too and that one, and that one (laughs) and then you go that's what we do in our prayers we go to God and throw to him all our problems That's how he feels at least. Even though you don't know it, that's how he feels. Because this passage says we should wrap all our our, our prayers in a beautiful gift bag. That gift bag is called thanksgiving. So you prepare a nice gift bag. You put all your issues in it. Then you go to God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. But heal me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Remember my son. Thank you, God. Thank. That's how we should go to him. You remind him of your problems. At the same time, you say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. But God, don't forget about my son, God, and my daughter. And my husband is not listening, God. Thank you. The Bible is funny. And then when you do that, after you come to God with thanksgiving, it says, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That means even when you see the problem, the peace of God will go beyond the problem. Above the problem, you will maintain your peace in the storm. That's what we, the Bible calls the peace that surpasses all understanding. No man, no person can, no, no one can understand it. It goes against the law of nature. It does that. If you go to Africa, you'll see children running. Running. Some of them are naked. Some of them are barefoot. They are running, happy, playing soccer. They are really happy. You see the happiness on them, the kids in Africa. You see it on the street. You see. Sometimes they don't even have food. Sometimes they are, they, they are full with dust and all that. But you see, you see the happiness. I grew up like that. I know what it means. We are happy. Then you take your plane. You come to Australia. You come to the West. Every child is surrounded by iPod, iPhone, iPad, iMac, i thought, i sit, i this, i that, i shoes, i shirt, i sh- i everything, i. Most miserable kids are in the West. Surrounded by all the eyes and still complaining. <laughs> life, oh life, oh life. Most children here grew up with a sense of entitlement. That's the problem. While children in Africa grew up with a sense of gratitude. When the mother bring a little bit of beans on the plate, you run. There is being on the <laughs> We have something to eat. You are grateful for it. But here, your mom will put I, I, I food, I potato, I, I everything on the, on the plate for you to eat. And you're like, what is for dinner today? 
What do you do now tonight? Sense of entitlement have, has made people in the West to lose the sense of gratitude. The sense of, because we think life is our right. There is nothing wrong for you to know your right. There's nothing wrong to know your right. You need to remember the source of your right. The source of your right. The problem is we forget the source of your right. Life is your right. But where does it come from? From God. It comes from God. If you remember the source of your right, you'll be grateful about it. If you forget the source of your right, you will think you are responsible for it. Or you think it comes from the government, or you think it comes from someone else, and you will start claiming it from that people. The government does not give us freedom. They keep it for us. God has given, given us freedom. It's the, the responsibility of the government to keep us free because God has given it to us. Yeah. Oh, they work for us. They, or at least they should work for us. No one gives you right. Jesus, God gave you right. People should just keep it, just respect it. They should respect it. If we can just appreciate the source, we will live with gratitude. Appreciate who gave the life to us. If you can't find anything to be grateful about, please find help. Please see someone. Yeah, and I mean it. Because there is time in life where you can't see anything to be grateful about. You just see everything is dark. If you are already in that place, reach out. That's when we make big mistakes in our lives. We should be able to see good things that are happening in our life. If you reached a place where everything is dark, you can't see anything to be grateful about, please talk to someone. Don't keep that to yourself. It is a serious condition. And it's not a joke. It is a serious condition. You need to see someone to help you reframe your perspective. If you can't see anything to be grateful about. Otherwise, if you can see something to be grateful about, and you just ignore it, please reframe your perspective. That's how we make peace with our present. And finally, let's make peace with our future. Are you following me? The gift of peace comes to make peace with our past. It comes to make peace with our present. And finally, make peace with our future. To make peace with your future is to choose hope. Is to choose hope. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this verse. Paul calls God the God of hope. God of hope. In other words, God is in charge of the future. He's in charge of the future. Hope, you can't have hope about the past, can you? No, no, you can't say, I'm hoping for last year, I will buy a car. I'm hoping, 20, 20 years ago, I'm hoping to marry that girl. Okay, find help. <laughs> if, hope is always in the future. We hope for something that might happen. So in the future, Paul is saying, God is already there. God is already in the future. We will find him there. He's already there. He sees it. No, God is not in the present checking the future. No, God is not looking at the future. And, oh, what is there? Oh, no, no. I need to make. No, 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 no. He is there. He is the future. He's already in the future. So while you are struggling to understand your life, God is already in the future. And Paul says, choose hope. Then he says, May he fill you with joy and peace. It's still, Paul is still blessing us. Joy is the reflection of fulfillment. When you are living in your present with that sense of gratitude, you have joy. Joy is the result of gratitude. 
That's what brings joy. As you live in gratitude, as you avoid, as you avoid worry, and you trust in God, the hope of the hope of God for the future will just overflow in your life. And that's what we want to do with our lives. That's what we want to do this Christmas. That's what we want to do for next year. Choose hope. There are so many things we can be anxious about for the future. You can be anxious about your health. You can be anxious about your finances. Yes, you may be anxious about your children. You may be anxious about the climate change. You may be anxious about many other things and, and, and inflation and, and this and that and politics. And We can be anxious about a million of things. We can, but Paul is telling us to put our trust in Jesus because he knows the future He's been in the future and he is the future. Jesus is the future. We don't need to worry about our future. He has a plan. Can you trust God? Trust. And I mean trust. Can you trust God for your children? Can you trust God for your finances? Can you trust God for the future of the world? Can you trust God with climate change? Can you trust God with inflation? You can find permanent peace today. Jesus has done everything to provide peace to us. 